Am I in the frame? Oh, yeah. Oh, how about that? Um, 
just not pull that off the all right, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, if you're asking yourself why there's a cell phone and why I have a microphone, it's we have a whole bunch of people following us on Facebook Live. And you'll be able to watch this presentation afterwards if you want, if there's a fun fact that you wanted to take home or share with somebody, or just refresh on what this project is all about, or some of the kind of takeaways of the Away project, you'll be able to do so afterwards. So uh, we're the One One Movement. I think uh, we know most, not some of you, we're an environmental nonprofit. We're based right here in this office space. Um, and we do environmental education in schools and community engagement uh, events really focused on sustainability, community health, environmental issues. Um, we'll focus on waste diversion, water conservation, sustainable food systems, and at times alternative energy and transportation. But our focus as an organization is really just getting the conversation started getting people excited about sustainability and finding ways to connect your passion, your interest, and the things that you care about to a sustainable lifestyle. So we're really just trying to start this conversation. Uh, we've been doing the Away Project in schools for over three years now. And uh, the idea was that we wanted for students to understand what waste meant from a more personal, a more tangible, a more individualized perspective. Um, we felt that coming into a school and telling kids about the Texasized island floating garbage patch in the Pacific went a little bit over their heads. And it's not just students, right? We felt that same way when we were having this conversation with adults. So when we asked ourselves, how do we really make this issue something that's a little bit more uh, uh, personal to an individual, we said, let's collect and carry our waste with us over the course of the week and allow for people to develop solutions that apply directly to them. You know, one of the things that we try not to do is to paint with a broad brush when it comes to sustainability and say, this is the solution that applies to everybody, or these are the problems that apply to everybody. So the Away Project, and Ilva will get into this in detail, um, is a week-long experiment on waste in which we go into a classroom, give each kid a reusable bag, and have them collect and carry their waste for the week. We have a custom web application that they can log into and create an account and track the waste that they generate and answer a few questions every day that helps prompt them through the process. And then Ilva will come back to the classroom on a Friday and conduct a waste audit with all the participants and help them develop personal, tangible, and sustainable solutions that apply directly to them. Um, as I said, we've been doing the Away Project for over three years now. We've reached over 8,000 students, mostly in San Diego, but we've led the Away Project remotely via Skype in classrooms in San Francisco, in New Jersey, in Florida, in Montreal, um, and a few other communities. The idea, once again, being that the students then get to develop their own personal connection to waste. Uh, so the Away Bags, which you guys are going to be getting, uh, we're an organization that's really focused on walking the walk and not only talking about sustainability, but trying to be as sustainable as possible. So when we were thinking about how do we produce these couple thousand bags that we're going to be bringing into schools, we looked at options and really all of them were from China. We couldn't find one sustainably produced local duffel bag option. So we said, let's make our own. Um, and, and that allows for us to weave a narrative in the schools that kids get really excited by, not only because every bag looks different, but because we made something out of trash. So these bags are made from waste vinyl banners that we literally pull out of the dumpster of printing shops, take down to a local manufacturing facility, and have them use discarded zippers and straps that were mismatched when they made custom large orders and put them together. So no away bag is uh, like any other. Uh, you guys will each be getting your own. Uh, and throughout the week, we encourage you guys to use the hashtag away project. Uh, we've never done this before in the community with adults and willing participants. We have a captive audience of students who have to participate because their teacher chose for them too. Um, so we want you guys to track this process, share it with your friends and family, tell them why you're electively collecting and carrying your waste for a week, and share with them your experience. You can say, hey, I didn't realize that I ate 12 bags of Flaming Hot Cheetos over a four-day period, and maybe I should do something about that. Um, so take pictures of your waste, take pictures of your bag, and please feel free to share it. You can tag Away Project, and you can always tag One to One Movement, which is One TO One Movement. So uh, without further ado, I'll introduce and pass the mic, literally, mm -hmm. to Ilva. Can I set this here? Sure can. Thanks all for coming. Yeah, thank you for being here. Um, 
Yeah, so my name is Ilva Windy. I am the Education Program Manager for One to One, and this is what I do. I talk to people about some of the problems facing the planet, and together we come up with solutions to try to solve those problems. So I want everyone here to understand that we're not going to judge you for what you put in the bag. I'm sure a lot of you are nervous about how much trash you might make, what kinds of trash you might make. I just want you to know there's no reason to feel nervous. There's no reason to feel uncomfortable because this is a process. I know that we have a few people here who have made really, really noble efforts towards zero waste and they might not have a whole lot in their bags, but they had to start somewhere. Everyone starts somewhere and that's why we're here. And I want to thank you guys for taking that step. No matter where you are on that journey, you're here tonight and I'm really grateful to have you and all of you joining us on the interwebs as well. Welcome. So, um, that being said, this is not a TED Talk, all right? I am not going to sell you guys a really slick solution to climate change. I'm not going to sell you a really slick solution to waste, right? What I'm going to do instead is introduce this problem. We're going to talk about why it's a problem and why it needs to be addressed. And if you guys have questions, if you have comments, I value the input that you guys are going to bring to the table tonight. And so please share. Um, we don't have to wait until the end because this is not a TED Talk. If you guys have questions, though, I would ask that you raise your hand politely and wait for me to call on you just because of my own train of thought and getting through all of this material. So please ask a question if you have it. All right, so this is the Away Project. The Away Project is an experiment about what we throw away. And we want to focus on what we throw away because, quite frankly, we make trash all the time. We make trash at home. We make trash at school, at work, while hiking, while camping in the middle of nowhere. We are constantly producing waste. And because we're constantly producing waste, and because we produce so much, this is definitely an area where we can improve. This is an area where we can make choices in our daily life to reduce the impact that we're having on the planet. All right? So, all of us produce trash. All right? We produce a lot of trash. The average American throws away about 4.3 pounds of trash, which means that going by that average, I just turned 30, I just threw away over 49,000 pounds of trash in my lifetime. I did not do that m math just now. I did that earlier today so I could be an average American. That's a lot of trash. I'm pretty young, but I'm sitting on a mountain of trash. And we all are, quite frankly, sitting on a mountain of trash. Now in the United States, we don't have to live with our trash. We don't see how much trash we make every day. Because when our trash cans at home fill up, when our trash cans at school fill up, we get to take them out to the curb. And then this amazing thing happens once it goes to the curb. It then goes away forever. And you never have to see those toothbrushes, those baby diapers, right? Those old homework assignments. You never have to see them again. Those old shoes, all of it goes away. But of course, we know that it never really goes away. It actually goes to a place. In the United States, it goes to a sanitary landfill. Now in San Diego, we used to dump our trash into canyons, but water flows through our canyon. And so we realized that we were starting to pollute our source of water. To keep the pollution out of our water source, we developed sanitary landfills. Sanitary landfill is exactly what it sounds like. It's a clean landfill for our waste. It means that we dug a hole in the ground, we line that hole with plastic, and then we dump the trash in. And to try to fit in as much trash as possible, we drive compactors over it all day long. It squishes it down into nice, neat little bundles. It also gets rid of things like rats and birds and other things that I would like to crawl in there inside of it. And then at the end of every day, we put a layer of plastic over it. We used to put about a 12-inch layer of dirt over, sorry. We used to put a 12-inch layer of dirt over the trash at the end of every day. But of course, our landfills were filling up very quickly. And so we replaced that 12-inch layer of dirt with a very thin layer of plastic. And so every day, it's a layer of trash, 
compacted with a layer of plastic. And that's worked pretty well for us since the 1950s, but our landfills are filling up. The Miramar landfill is supposed to be completely full within a decade, and the 3,500 landfills that we have in the United States are also due to fill up soon, right? If not in the next decade, they'll fill up eventually. Um, does anyone here have any sort of idea of what we could do with our trash if our landfills do fill up? Anyone want to offer up a solution? It's not a solution, but isn't yeah. it true that we send our trash to other parts of the world to be sorted through? And yeah, so, so it brings up a really good point. So she asked if we send our trash to other parts of the world. Some would argue we don't consider it trash, right? We send a lot of our e-waste to other countries that don't have the same environmental laws that we do. And I'm gonna talk more about that. But yeah, we do actually send a lot of the recyclables to other countries to get fully recycled, right? Here in California, we actually um, put in about 99% of our waste into California's own landfills. So only 1% of California's waste actually gets exported, and it gets exported to other states, not to other countries. That's the official number. 99% of it is here on California soil. That's the trash that doesn't end up in the recycling stream. Right? No one else has a solution? Yeah? Jenny? We can make more landfills. Yeah, so we can make more. Do you want to, are you offering up your backyard for a landfill? Sure. Does Encinitas need a new landfill? Okay. They don't mind? Yeah, so we live in a big place, right? A lot of people think that it's perfectly fine to send your trash to Nevada. Nevada is just rock. Right? That's what a lot of people think. And so we can definitely find new places where we can send our trash. That's an option. If you don't mind sacrificing that habitat, if you don't mind sacrificing the groundwater in that area, if you don't mind sacrificing the aesthetic and the communities that actually live there, that's always an option to just build new ones. Yes, so in Sweden, they actually incinerate their trash. It's not the same as burning your trash in a burn barrel. That burns trash at a very low temperature, which releases a lot of air pollution, such as dioxins. When you burn plastic, you release a lot of those petrochemicals into the atmosphere. You also cause a chemical change in those petrochemicals that produce what are called dioxins, which we know are carcinogenic. So rather than burning trash at a low temperature like everyone in California used to do, instead they incinerate it in a specially designed box that burns it really hot and really fast. But what are they left over with when they burn all of that trash? Ash. And that ash is pretty toxic. So here in California we did at one time have incinerators that burned our trash. The problem is that we were left with a lot of toxic ash that we had to deal with in California. Um, we were recently in National City, and we saw a beautiful empty lot of land surrounded by development, and we asked, why is that land undeveloped? And the answer was that it was actually formally a site for dumping toxic ash from incinerators. So because they t dumped that toxic ash back in the 70s, that area is now considered too toxic to grow on, it's considered too toxic to develop, and so it's going to sit there empty and inert and unused because we do have a lot of these sites that have to deal with our toxic ash. Yeah. Any other solutions? Uh, we have dumped yeah. in the ocean, right? Yes, and we currently dump in the ocean all the time on accident, right? We don't drive our garbage trucks over to you know, Pacific Beach and dump our trash in, but on accident, a lot of our trash ends up in the ocean. Yeah. We could send it to space. The students always love to say we can send it to space. So absolutely, right? We could send it to space. We currently have over 6,000 pieces of space junk, that's the official term from NASA, space junk floating around the, pa the planet. And those are just things like satellites from telephone companies that don't exist anymore. There's a golf ball floating in space because a Canadian sports agency paid a cosmonaut to hit it off the space station, 
right? We have a lot of junk in space already, right? And that's just from doing science and advertising in space. We make a lot of trash. They say that if you lined up all the garbage trucks that take away our trash every day in the United States, bumper to bumper, they would extend from San Diego halfway to the moon. That's how many garbage trucks we fill up every day. And instead of filling up those garbage trucks, we would have to fill up rockets and send those into space instead. Do you have a solution? What's your solution? Composting? What's composting? Yeah, food trash. So composting is nature's way of recycling, right? Nature doesn't waste anything. It doesn't make sense to waste. And so by composting, you would keep a lot of trash out of a landfill. Very good. And to be honest, that's California's solution, right? They're not going to build rockets and they're not going to build more landfills. California's big plan and San Diego's plan is to become what we call zero waste, which means that you keep trash out of a landfill. To keep trash out of a landfill, that means you divert things that don't belong there. Things like food scraps. Food scraps do not belong in a landfill. Once they arrive in a landfill, they're unable to break down. They don't biodegrade. In order for something to decompose, there needs to be oxygen, the correct temperature, and also decomposers. In a landfill, with all that squishing and squeezing, there's not a whole lot of oxygen. So even something like a banana peel that ends up inside of a landfill will not be able to decompose. Instead, it turns kind of goopy and starts to produce methane gas. Now we capture this methane gas and we use it as natural gas inside of our homes, but we have leaks all the time. Los Angeles had a very serious leak um, back in the spring. They were leaking you know, thousands of pounds of methane into the atmosphere every day and it took a long time for them to cap that leak. So that's always a danger that you won't be able to manage the methane, that greenhouse gas, from entering the atmosphere. So by composting all of that food, we keep food out of a landfill, and then we also keep all of those nutrients in the system. Just because we can't digest banana peels and eggshells doesn't mean that they're not full of nutrients. So by composting them, you return those nutrients back into the soil so we can grow healthy plants in the future. It also means that we keep recyclables out of a landfill, right? So in California, we're required by law to recycle 50% of our recyclables. If we don't recycle 50%, the state of California fines the city $10,000 every day, right? So the most that we've ever really been able to recycle is about 63%, right? We're really good at reaching the 50%. Sometimes we get as high as 63, but we've never done better than 63, which means that a lot of recyclables also end up in our landfills. Right? Now, landfills, to be honest, are not the most serious problem that we face when we talk about waste. Landfills are kind of like the icing on the cake of the waste problem because a lot of our trash does not end up in a landfill. Instead, a lot of our trash ends up in our natural environment. So this is a photo of the Tijuana River estuary here in San Diego. Um, as you'll notice, it's full of mostly plastics and styrofoam. We have oil containers, right, 7-up bottles, uh, five-gallon jugs, lots of milk jugs, and lots and lots of takeaway styrofoam containers, right? So that's here in our neck of the woods. This is what our community looks like, right? Now the problem with these materials ending up in our natural environment is that a lot of these materials are made out of plastic. And plastic is made out of oil, which are turned into different petrochemicals. And as far as we know, there aren't a whole lot of fungi, there aren't a whole lot of decomposers that like to eat petrochemicals. And so these petrochemicals do not biodegrade. So that means that all of the plastic that has ever been made is still sitting here on the planet somewhere. We've burned some of it in incinerators, like in Sweden. Right? We've been burned some of it because we were desperate to stay warm in other places in the, in the world, but most of it is still sitting somewhere on the planet. In California, we build storm drains so that our cities don't flood. When you pour water over dirt, dirt soaks up the water, but when you pour water over concrete, 
the water rushes off. So we need a way to make sure that our cities don't flood during heavy rains. And so we invented storm drains. Storm drains are a great way to keep our cities from flooding, but it does introduce a lot of environmental pollution because anything that is on the street washes down inside the storm drain. And so that includes things like plastic pollution, such as chip bags, styrofoam cups. It includes things like dog feces, includes things like motor oil. Anything on the street gets into our waterways. And all of our waterways lead into what? The ocean, exactly. So all waterways lead into the ocean, which is why we're currently experiencing an ecological disaster inside of our oceans. So it's really difficult to gauge how much plastic ends up in our ocean. A lot of scientists say that so much plastic is entering our oceans now that by 2050 the weight of the plastic will outweigh the fish in the ocean. The problem, again, is that plastic never really goes away. You can say there will be that much plastic by 2050 because the plastic is not going to biodegrade inside the ocean. Instead, it photodegrades, which means that as it bakes under the sun and it floats in the salt water, it starts to crack and break apart into smaller and smaller pieces called microplastics. These microplastics have a greater surface area than volume, so they attract a lot of pollutants. And so animals swallow these microplastics, and then it's what we call bioaccumulation. Those toxins start to accumulate in the food system, all right, in the food chain, if you will. So small fish eat the microplastics, big fish eat the smaller fish, and then birds like albatross will eat the smaller fish, they will also eat the plastic, right? And like I was saying, this plastic contains a lot of toxins. And so once it gets, the plastic gets inside of the body, it can poison the fish, it can cause harm to a reproductive system, it can also get lodged in its stomach. It's very easy for a bird to swallow plastic. It's very, very difficult for a bird to pass that plastic back out. And so what happens is these birds start to swallow plastic, their bellies start to swell and fill up with all of these plastic items, and they feel full and they no longer eat real food. Right? California and Hawaii. Jonathan mentioned what else is between California and Hawaii, which is the Pacific Garbage Patch, and I'm going to correct him. It's actually not the size of Texas. Most scientists say it's triple the size of Texas, right? But it's very, very difficult to gauge exactly how large it is because it's constantly changing with the currents, and it's also not just a floating island. You should really think of it as much more like a plastic soup, right? As plastics sit on the surface, they start to photodegrade, break apart, and so there are plastics not just on the surface of the ocean, but at every level of the ocean, right? And these birds live in the middle of this plastic soup. But it's not just plastic that ends up inside our natural environment, right? A lot of toxic waste and toxic chemicals also end up inside our natural environment. Right? E-waste is a major source of toxic pollution. Inside everyone's computer, smartphone, there is lead, cadmium, arsenic, precious heavy metals, and a lot of it ends up being discarded. This is one of those materials that we tend to ship to other countries. Because there are so many toxic chemicals inside these products, we have very strict laws about how they can be recycled here in the United States. We have those laws because we want to keep people safe and because the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, has determined that the introduction of these toxic chemicals into the environment is extremely dangerous for humans, for the organisms that live in that area. Right? So these are things that we tend to ship to other places and they've caused extreme environmental hazards there. Now, once these chemicals and once these pollutants enter, enter these ecological systems, it's very, very difficult to clean them up. The Pacific Garbage Patch is so devastating because it's going to be so hard to clean. 
right? Maybe it's the size of Texas. Maybe it's triple the size of Texas, right? We don't really know because it's really difficult to, you know, it's very difficult to study. It's very difficult to find, right? One day it was at this coordinates, and the next day it's at a different set of coordinates. It's constantly moving, right? And again, it's not a floating island, but a plastic soup. And once these pollutants enter the environment, we try to do these cleanups that often conceal the problem for a short matter of time, but they never really fix the problem. Okay? So here in the United States, our standard method of dealing with toxic chemicals and toxic pollution is to bury it underground in a sealed container. Sometimes a sealed container is made out of concrete, sometimes it's made out of layers of plastic, sometimes it's simply made out of layers of soil. And this is not a final solution, it's a stopgap. So recently, in East Chicago, before I lived in San Diego, I lived in Chicago, all right? And in East Chicago, in East Chicago, um, they recently had to put up signs in a housing development telling folks that their kids can't play outside. The reason why their kids can't play outside is because they put that housing complex on a former lead refinery site. They knew that lead was refined there, but they buried it under soil. But the lead did not stay under several layers of soil. Instead, layer, there were layers of lead in the topsoil. And so these kids who grew up in these housing developments were developing you know, brain damage, and they were developing learning impediments because they were being exposed to lead from the time they were babies. Imagine telling your kid in the summertime that they can't go outside and play on the grass. Imagine telling your kid to stay on the street because the street is more clean than the grass. And that's the reality of the people who live in East Chicago. All right? And it's not just East Chicago. It's Portland, Oregon. Right? It's here in San Diego. We have areas in San Diego, like in National City, where we have to tell kids, don't go down there and play in that empty lot. There is lead, arsenic, and other pollutants. Right? So we can build other landfills. We have the space, we have the empty space, but that means a housing development someday will have to tell their children, don't go out and play, right? You might get lead poisoning. You might be exposed to arsenic. You might be exposed to chlorine. You might be exposed to other carcinogens, right? This is a problem that is happening all the time. It's a problem that maybe isn't reported on very much, but it is affecting our health. It's affecting our health daily. Now, the way that we deal with this waste after the fact, post-consumer, when we're done with it, that's really important. And we need to address how we deal with toxic waste. We need to address what we do when our landfills fill up. We need to address how do we keep trash out of the ocean. And a really, really important way to do that is addressing how our waste gets created at the source. Where is our waste coming from? Right? Where are things that become waste to us? Are things that eventually become trash? Where do they come from and how are they made? Because right? everything you buy, everything you use had to get created somewhere. Right? It required human labor. It required natural resources. It required it did a lot of waste. Now, a lot of these places Right, are also going to become very, very vulnerable with climate change. So a lot of these factories that refine lead, factories that you know, produce cars, factories that you know, produce nuclear power, factories that produce computers, they all manage really dangerous materials every day. And we found that with climate change and with hurricanes, with earthquakes, with all of these devastating natural disasters, these Isolated little places of these toxic chemicals don't stay isolated anymore. Fukushima has resulted in, you know, entire area, huge tracts of land in Japan becoming um, polluted with radiation. Hurricane Katrina, right, caused the lead and the. I'm sorry. Excuse me. One moment. Let me gather my thoughts for a second. Let's take a second. So Hurricane Katrina also resulted in several toxic dump sites being spread throughout the entire floodplain of Louisiana. Right? Once we bury it, once we take care of it, it's still 
capable of moving, all right? It's still capable of spreading into our environment, right? Not just in the places where we bury it, but also in the places where we make all of this stuff, okay? And again, it's everything we buy and everything we use, all right? From the smartphone, from the computer, from the watch, from the shoes, right? To make this, it required natural resources that had to be dug out of the ground by someone, somewhere, all right? To make this, it required a lot of human labor. It required human labor to design it, to think about it, right? To have the idea of this thing. We use a lot of human labor to create everything we use, all right? And to make this thing, it also required shipping goods all over the world, and it required burning a lot of fossil fuels. And this is where most of our waste comes from. Most of our waste doesn't come from getting rid of this when we're done with it. Most of our waste really comes from buying these things and all of that waste that came before. Even small things like straws, right, stirrers, plastic bags, plastic cups, paper cups, sunglasses, hats, all of these things get created in some form that requires natural resources and requires energy. And that's where we feel that the greatest change can be made by making really sensible choices about what we need and asking ourselves really qu critical questions like, will it really make me happy, right? Why do I want it? Why do I need it, right? To address these problems, definitely we need to have governments on board, we need to have legislation, we need to have the Environmental Protection Agency actually do its job, right? We need all of these organizations to take part but the individual and the individual's choices, that has a huge effect. I should probably go back to that picture of the Tijuana River estuary, right? Because that's simply the daily choices of lots of individuals, right? It makes change. It makes a difference. When everyone chooses to throw their cup onto the street, when everyone chooses to use a styrofoam cup, you saw the effects of that, all right? When you do the opposite, that also has an effect. Might be harder to see, but it's just as real. And so we're not asking everyone to be perfect, right? I certainly have not moved to the woods and changed my, set, my name to Moonbeam, right? And adopted like a pure zero waste lifestyle, right? Maybe I'm working there, I don't really know. We'll see where life takes me, but that's not really what I aspire for, and that's not really what I want. Instead, I want to find ways that I can lessen my impact on the world, right? Ways that I find sustainable for me, ways that I enjoy, right? And ways that make me feel more fulfilled. That's what it's about for me. And so if we do want a better world in the future, if we want a better world for our kids, right? We have to think about where we can make those own changes in our own personal lives, because to be quite honest, the world's trashed. The choices that we're making and the lifestyles we're living, that's having a serious effect on the planet. And that's why we're trying to talk to people and see what changes we can make. Which is where the AWAY project comes in. So, like I said, this is a process, all right? We're not expecting everyone to go zero waste this week. Rather, the only way this really works is if you're really honest about how much trash you make, right? If you're feeling insecure, or if you're trying to cheat a little bit, right, you buy the organic chips instead of the Fritos, right? Like, that's not really honest. And this only works if you're honest, all right? And no one here is going to judge you, okay? Um, I certainly won't be able to judge. We're going camping this weekend, and I promise you my dog is going to create a lot of trash while we go camping. It's inevitable, right? So how it works is you guys will all receive a bag from us today. You are going to carry this bag with you everywhere you go. You're going to carry it to work, you're going to carry it home, you're going to take it, I don't know, to whatever events you choose to participate in this week, and you're going to collect your trash and your recycling. Don't recycle anything this week, we'll recycle it next Thursday, all right? Um, we also will provide you with um, daily questions every day. So these are daily questions to help you um, 
you know, understand the process. These are daily questions to help us understand what kind of trash adults are making. Jonathan mentioned that we do this project with kids all the time, and they answer very similar questions. And we're kind of curious about how this works with adults. You guys have very different needs and different challenges when it comes to the Away project. And so we've developed questions to help you through that. Um, and then next week, we will all return back here. We're going to sort through all of our trash. And then you guys, not me, but you guys, are going to come up with solutions on how we can reduce the types of trash that we make. All right, so these are things that are realistic for you, right? Um, it might not be realistic to stop eating Flaming Hot Cheetos, right? But maybe you can just make Flaming Hot Cheetos a really special treat for when you really deserve it, okay? So whatever is actually reasonable for you to accomplish, right? Um, there are a few things that do not go inside the bag. We don't want any sanitary waste. All right, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. If you take off a Band-Aid, if you blow your nose, if you clean your ears, do not put any of those things inside the bag. If it is gross, if it is nasty, if it is funky, we don't want it. If you wouldn't want to touch it, if it belonged to someone else, just don't put it in the bag. Pretty good rule to follow. Um, also, no food scraps. A lot of the trash you're going to make this week will be from eating food. I definitely, all right, so if you have a bag of chips, shake out the bag before you put it in the bag. Did you happen to bring the bag back upstairs? Um, so shake out the bag before you put it in. If you have one of those really frothy frappuccino drinks, please like make sure there's no milk inside. I'm not even really sure it's milk. It never really molds. To be honest, I've seen those in the bags and they don't really mold. I've never really thought about it till just now. Yeah. So anyway, but wash it out. If you have a carton of milk, wash it out before you put it in the bag. Um, some of you will be confused if it's your trash or not, right? Like moms who give everyone their cereal in the morning will be left with a cereal box. If you are the person who's going to throw it away, you got to put it inside your bag. All right? That's the way it works. Um, but again, it's up to your discretion. If you were the one who was going to throw it away, but really it was someone else who made that trash, right? You can like work that out amongst yourselves. Um, Oh, and also no glass. You guys will probably have some glass this week. I know I will probably have some glass by the end of tonight to be put in there, right? Don't put any glass inside because it will probably break and then it will be really dangerous for you to reach inside your bag next week. Any questions? Uh, just one quick question. Uh, say you're walking around the beach or something and you pick up trash. Like what's, what do you say about that? Just like, you know, collecting other people's trash. So I really think that it works best when it's just the trash you made, right? Because it's really hard for you to come up with solutions for other people, right? As much as we would like to, right? So really try to focus. I do encourage you to do that, right? Maybe wear gloves, okay? Or do, get one of those like shark mouth things, right? They, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So get one of those um, and like have at it, but don't put it inside the bag. It'll also keep it cleaner. Yes. Um, they make a machine that makes plastic and trash. And then they're really powerful, and then it explodes the whole world. And then, not the whole world, but this type of machine, but more people will think it. Yeah. Where did you hear about this? <laughs> Where? <laughs> in your head? Yeah? Absolutely. The most important thing is that everyone is safe this week. Absolutely. I want everyone to be safe, happy, healthy, and productive and collect their own trash. Right? Absolutely. Anybody else? Yeah. Sit in the bag. Very good. Someone might have na pizza this week and your na pizza box will be too big for the bag. Right? Try to crush things down as much as possible. Um, if you drink a lot of water bottles, not the water bottles, you would drink the water inside the water bottle, but if you do have anything like that, um, crush it down before you put it in the bag. And then also part of the daily questions will be asking you, did you have something that was too big for the bag? Amazon package, shoe box, a pizza box, right? 
So anything that's too big, we'll ask you to record it in the daily questions. Um, are you encouraged to record the things that you can, like if you have glass, like to just write it instead of putting it in your bag? Yeah, so um, I do encourage you guys to answer the daily questions because it'll also help you keep track of all those things that can't go inside the bag, right? A major source of waste is going to be food waste, right? So we're also going to ask you, like, how much food you throw away every day, right? Not in, like, poundage, but, you know, like, I threw away three apple cores and two pizza crusts, right? Things like that. We'll ask you to record as well. And if we're composting any, all of our food waste, uh, do you still want us, to, want us to record that as well? Um, no, I don't consider that food waste. So yeah, if you're composting, thank you for composting. Um, but no, I wouldn't consider that waste, so I wouldn't include that. Can you consider mail that you receive from some, or something that you receive from somebody else? A junk mail? If you're gonna throw it away, it goes in the bag. Yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah. Same here. So we've actually requested to get off the mailing list, but because we live in a giant building, right, they just put it in an, every single box anyway, because there are like 50 boxes sitting there. So even though we've requested multiple times, we still get all of those mailers just like everyone else. So good luck with that. Let's see how it goes. Any other questions about what we talked about today? Do you have any questions? I know it was a little distracting, and I really want to apologize for my sort of distracted way of presenting this material. And so if I left some gaping hole in my explanation, or if I just stopped mid-sentence and didn't finish my thought, I would love you to point that out so I can answer those questions as well. Yeah, so the reason why they seal it every day, it's part of the sanitary landfill um, uh, like code, right? So um, they seal it so that animals can't get into it. They seal it so it can't blow away. They seal it so it can't escape the landfill and also so that contaminants like birds and you know, other critters also can't come in and access it. Nate? We have a question from the audience. Oh. I forgot about so you. So what about family members like kids? So like if the adult's participating but the kid isn't, um, is the adult responsible for like also collecting their child's waste? Again, if you were going to throw it away, you should put it in the bag. I know it's not fair. Some of us are just really responsible, right? And we deal with all of that, but it still goes in your bag. Anybody else? No? All right, well, let me check the time real fast. Okay. Um, I am curious about why everyone chose to join us tonight. Could you raise your hand if you work in the environmental sector in some way? A few. Would anyone like to share why they were interested in attending tonight? What your interests are in zero waste or learning more about where your trash goes and how you, how you can reduce it? I don't know. I have a kind of interesting story about how I found out about this organization. Okay. Yeah, so there, um, uh, that's very cool. You heard about us on Reddit and came to our film fest. Thank you very much for being a stranger at our film fest. We really appreciate that. Um, there are lots of really great things about living in America. There's so many great things about living here, but we do waste a lot. We just waste so much. 
And like I was saying earlier, it really doesn't make sense to waste. And to be honest, throughout human history, we didn't waste stuff, right? If the, my leather baby sling broke, I would simply use that leather as a pouch to carry nuts home later, right? If my spear broke, I would simply use that you know, spear point that I worked hours and hours and hours to create into you know, a new spear or maybe an arrowhead, right? I was definitely a spear thrower in my former life, without a doubt. So we just did not waste, right? It was never part of our cultures. It was never part of our lifestyle. We always really valued the things we had. We took care of them because throughout human history, it was really hard to have stuff. It was really hard to find food. It was really hard to carry your baby around. It was really hard to have utensils to carry home food. And so we always took care of our stuff. This idea of throwing stuff away that was really you know, labor intensive and really expensive, that's a relatively new phenomenon, right? So that's why we really you know, believe in the Away Project, because this is learned behavior and because it's something we learn from our culture, we can actually change it from the inside, right? It's our society that helps us waste. And so, you know, we're members of society. We can, we can make change. Yeah? We could um, make the old stuff into new Yeah, so we can make the old stuff into new stuff. So my leather skirt used to be... Um, I don't know if you guys can see it, but my leather skirt actually used to be a leather jacket, right? So they cut up the leather jacket and they made it, it was a really ugly leather jacket, I'm assuming, and they made it into a bunch of pretty cute leather skirts, right? Our t-shirts used to be different kinds of t-shirts and then they remade them into these. Yeah, so you can make old stuff into new stuff. I think they call that upcycling, make it better. Yeah? Yeah, I'm going to share that with our virtual audience, if you don't mind. So she was mentioning that um, she was hoping that this project would allow her to identify problem areas because she feels like there's like a general, um, excuse me if I'm paraphrasing really poorly, but generally there's room for improvement, correct? And so by identifying those actual problem areas makes it more tangible and easier for you to address. And that will definitely happen if you treat this um, as a real experiment, you're really honest about it, right? That's the only way that will actually work for you. Yeah. Yeah? Well, my girlfriend and I find it really scary sometimes. So with all the stuff that you mentioned in your, in your, uh, in your speech about you know, the way they treat our trash. And so we've been making an effort in our own home to reduce our waste more and more. More here than me. I'm lucky that I have her to support. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's nice to see that there's organizations like you that kind of help us to realize what we're doing with all our waste. Mm -hmm. It's not easy these days. No, it's actually it's really difficult these really days. <laughs> yeah, so ironically, to have this job teaching you guys about waste, I had to do a few things. I had to buy a car, because I didn't have, own a car. I had to make sure I had a smartphone, and I had to make sure I had a laptop. All right. I didn't have any of these things before I started my job, but come on, we live in 2016 and you need to have these things to have a job. Not always, but sometimes, right? So my iPhone is refurbished. Rather than buying a new iPhone, I don't know what it is. It, it, is, it is an iPhone, but I don't know like what generation. I don't know, a grandchild, certainly. But um, I bought it, well, my husband bought it refurbished, right? So it's an iPhone. It works perfectly well. I would never know that someone else owned it. Um, and I think it saved us a lot of money, correct? So it saved us a lot of money, and it's perfectly fine. Um, I borrow my computer from someone else and bought my car used, right? So 
it's really overwhelming. Like the thought of owning a car felt really stressful because it felt really wasteful. Um, but it's necessary to live and you got to accept that some things are necessary to get through your day and hopefully not feel too guilty about it because we're all just trying to get by. And again, this is what's sustainable for you, right? It's whatever you're able to achieve and know that it's a process and you'll never be perfect, right? Because Again, we live in a place that doesn't allow us to be perfect, right? It makes it really hard. So don't beat yourself up too much about it, but always look for ways to improve. Yeah. Jonathan? So it is 7.30 now. Perfect. And we did want to respect anybody else's plans if they had plans. We said we'd be about an hour. Um, we want to encourage any and everyone who's interested in sticking around. We do want to have a conversation, but also if someone has to leave, um, we can get that process moving as well. I just want to make two quick announcements. Um, one, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but please, please, please make sure to bring your bags back next Thursday. We use these in schools, and we try to keep our programming at low cost and almost always free to schools, but we can do so because we're resourceful, and we keep reusing these bags time after time. So if we don't get them back, we can't take them into a classroom. Um, and two, next week on Thursday when you come back, if you'd like to bring a blank t-shirt with you, we developed a process recently for creating new shirts out of old shirts, and actually our wonderful model, Monica Graves, is wearing one of the designs that we recently made. Trash is the failure of imagination. So what we did is uh, we uh, had that design made, and we created a screen, and then we got a product which actually removes color, decolor, from shirts. So it's taking the color out of it instead of printing onto it, which is a lot of fun. Um, so if you want to bring a t-shirt with you next Friday, we'd be happy to give everybody one at no cost, obviously. Next Thursday. Uh, next Thursday. And you'll have your own trash is the failure of imagination shirt after having participated in a week long trash experiment. Dark colored t shirts. Yeah, dark colored t shirts. Anything darker than light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I want to thank you once again for coming tonight. Um, I recognize a few faces, but most of you I don't recognize. So thank you so much for taking the time to come down here and listen to you know, our program and to, more importantly, participate in this experiment. Um, if you would like to head out now, um, you can grab a bag from Jonathan. Like you said, please bring it back next week. All right. You might get tired of us. You might not really want to like hear us again or hang out with us again. That's OK. But please bring us back our bags. Think about it this way. If you don't bring your bag back, that is one child in San Diego who cannot participate in the Away Project. Think about it that way. All right. We do need them back. Nate? What if something comes up for someone and they can't make it next Thursday? I totally understand. Um, if you can't make it next Thursday, you know where we're at, right? You know where we're located. Um, you will be able to participate via Facebook Live, correct, Nate? So you'll be able to participate that way, and you can log in later if you really want to hear what I have to say. Um, and then simply empty out your bag. Please recycle your recyclables, and just return it to us at your convenience. All right? Yeah, thanks again. Really appreciate it. And we will be around to answer questions as well. All right, thanks.